What do dinosaur voice boxes have to do with birds? Well, hello again. It is Ken Colson here from Creation Unfolding. And uh, today on our interview series, again, with Dr. McLean, we're going to be looking at uh, voice boxes. Uh, but they're dinosaurian voice boxes, so that's pretty interesting. So uh, I want to welcome again Dr. McLean. Dr. McLean, welcome back. Um, tell me, what what are we? What first of all, what's a voice box, and what are we talking about today? Yeah, well, thanks, Dr. Colson, for having me on here. And um, yeah, we're talking about uh, the larynx. Um, so there are in in our vertebrate animals. You know, you've got something in your, essentially in your throat, kind of back there that allows you to be able to make sounds and noises, right? Um, and different animals have different kinds of constructions. Um, and so, you know, if you had asked me, I guess before a few months ago, um, would we ever know what a dinosaur might have sounded like? I'd just be like, no, I mean, we really, we really wouldn't. Actually, there's been a lot of people recently who said things like, you need to stop making dinosaurs roar in movies because they probably couldn't do that. They could probably just hiss like an alligator and, you know, make those kinds of noises. Yeah. And uh, it's the same thing with color, right? Back in the day, they said, oh, we'll never know what color a dinosaur is. And now actually several dinosaurs, we do have a good idea of color. And mm -hmm. it turns out with a new discovery here, we might actually have a, at least a little bit more of a glimpse as to what dinosaurs, at least some dinosaurs, when it sounded like. Right. And that's because the that that larynx is the kind of the organ for producing tones, et cetera. Yeah. So once again, it depends on the animal. Um, so it's important in that sound production. Um, but certain animals do some funky things. So like birds are a good example of that. Birds have, you know, um, stuff going on kind of like our voice box. But then lower than that, they have an, a specialized structure called a syrinx. And that's actually what is producing most of the noise in a bird, mm -hmm. like to be able to do like songs and stuff. But then the larynx higher up will adjust various aspects of it, like volume okay. or particular sound um, shapes and things like that. Okay. Um, whereas in us, our vocal cords are right there with the with the larynx. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so what did they learn about this? What, what is yeah. it about this uh, voice box that is so interesting? I mean, I think it's pretty cool that they found a voice box. Yeah, that's pretty right. cool at all, right? That, that's I mean, there. that yeah. is very, very cool. So uh, what did they learn yeah. about this thing? Yeah, so uh, we can start with the, the animal they found it in. So it is a dinosaur, but as you know, there's lots of different types of dinosaurs. And this is an ankylosaur. So these are the dinosaurs that are walking on all fours. They've got tons of armor all over their backs. Mm -hmm. They have tail clubs at the end they can smack things with for these particular ankylosaurs. And so this one is called Pinacosaurus. Um, they've also found similar things in another one called Cychenia. And these are both um, ankylosaurs from Asia. And they're, like I said, very heavily armored. Even the skulls got armor all over it, everything, bony armor. And um, this particular one, they found um, the different parts of the larynx. So there's these different um, things that will either be cartilage or bone, depending on the type of animal you're looking at. Um, things that are, they're called special names like cricoid and arytenoid and all these different things. Um, and they, what they discovered was that they were here, which was shocking because they hadn't found them in dinosaurs before. Mm. And, um, and like I said, some animals, like a lot of our reptiles, they're cartilaginous in birds. They're, um, ossified, if I understand correctly. And so when these you dinosaurs, cartilaginous yeah, and ossified, you mean like cartilage and bone, right? Cartilage and bone. Yep. So yep, in yep. most of these, you know, reptiles, there tend to be cartilage and this dinosaur, it looks like they are bony, um, as well as in a lot of our birds, um, and uh, this is a really cool discovery because, yeah, we actually can start to understand what was going on. How would they um, open this up? And because it can move, you know, basically as part of the, the sound producing process. Um, and so that's really cool to be able to see that. Um, but the really exciting part, I think, even more than that, and we'll get to sound production maybe a little bit later, but is um, what it looked like. Because when you're trying to guess what an extinct animal's structure looks like, right? Um, let's say it's a heart, right? What do dinosaur hearts look like? Well, how do you guess that? You have to look at the most similar animals we have today, right? Mm -hmm. So let's pretend for a minute we want to know what a woolly mammoth's heart looks like. Well, that's pretty easy because a woolly mammoth is just an elephant with fur, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's probably going to be really weird if it had like a two-chambered heart, you know, and every other elephant has a four-chambered. That'd be really strange, Right, right. Well, with a dinosaur, it's trickier because, you know, we look at an ankylosaur, there's no animal alive 
today that looks like that, right? Or functions like that. Mm -hmm. um, the closest animals you have by doing comparative anatomy and by doing genetic studies for, you know, obviously can't do it with dinosaurs, but for the similar things, you're going to end up with a crocodile type animal on one side and a bird on the other, right? And so crocodiles and birds are very different creatures. I mean, remotely different. right? And so that doesn't really give you a lot of help for guessing those kinds of soft tissue structures. Right. And so to have this preserved here where it's not normally, this is really cool because it's opening up that window mm. where before you had no clue, right? You're like, well, crocodiles have this, birds have this, who knows, right? It could be anything in between. Right. Um, yeah. So that's the exciting part for me. Um, so like, yeah. So on the screen, um, you can see that we've got a uh, cladogram they've drawn here. Right. Um, showing the different, um, they say here, hyolaryngeal apparatus in um, different animals, right? So um, you can see the different parts they've labeled there. Um, and the out here, we've got a gecko. Um, we've got one from a turtle right here, two different turtles. We've got one from a crocodilian right mm -hmm. there, an alligator actually. And um, then over here, we've got an ostrich and we've got a parrot. And then right here, we have our panacosaurus. Right. Um, just, and... to, just to clarify, so in this cladogram there, we've got the archosaurs on the left and the aves on the right and uh, the dinosauri sort of in the middle. And so that's kind of from an evolutionary perspective is trying to explain some kind of uh, relationship, right? Sure. Yeah. So and you can see, I was going to say, you see these rectangles or they're near rectangles here, right? Yeah. And those are showing you the different groups, right? So you've got Aves is inside of Dinosauria, is inside of Archosauria, is inside of Reptilia. Okay. Um, now, yeah, as you said, an evolutionist thinks that these things are actually evolving. We'll talk about that in a minute. Right. But for our purposes, we can just say, hey, there's, you know, taxonomic groups here, classification stuff. Okay. Right? And so we know, like I said, if you do comparative anatomy, your closest living animals to a dinosaur be either a crocodilian or a bird. It falls in between there, right? Right. And- this particular dinosaur we're looking at, these armored dinosaurs, they have nothing to do with the evolution of birds and the evolutionary model, right? right? I mean, these are these are as far away from a bird as you can get evolutionarily and still be a dinosaur. That's kind of the idea. Yep. Um, and what was surprising is that these actually have several features that you only find in birds. So they list these right here. Um, you can see, for instance, our larynx is ossifiable, right? It can be bone. Um, whereas these guys, it tends to be cartilage over here. Um, you can see that the retinoid is long. There's a special joint that's only here. The cricoid is big. The, the, the retinoid, uh, just just so that the viewers can see, that's the green colored things. Yep. Yep. And, and then the, the cricoid, cricoid is, is the purple thing. The purple. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's there's a special joint that's there that's only present in these two groups. And so you can see, for instance, like how skinny your right. um, you know retinoids are on a crocodilian versus like these thicker things and these. And the point is, we're not saying that this, you know, is the, the dinosaur one is just like a bird one. No, no, nobody's saying that. They're obviously very different. Right. But the point is, there are certain traits that are only found in the bird and the dinosaur one that are not found in these other reptiles. Right. And that's really interesting, right? Because this animal is nothing like a bird, mm -hmm. <laughs> remotely like a bird. Right. And I doubt it would make the same noises as a bird. We have no evidence for a syrinx down there um, that hasn't been preserved in any of these dinosaurs. So we don't know exactly what noises they could make. Um, you know, I don't think it's going around going chirp, 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 you know, like a bird. Um, That'd be interesting. But yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's it's fascinating because you would predict, right, that, okay, well, they've got some features in common with crocodilians, some features in common with birds. They're very different animals. They're their own unique thing. But I might expect this feature I didn't know about before, maybe it would have a combination of traits. And sure enough, that's what it has, right? Mm -hmm. And so an evolutionist looks at that and they say, well, obviously, right? Because dinosaurs mm -hmm. are on the line to birds. Mm -hmm. So how do you think through it as a creationist? Well, I think sometimes as creationists, we get really scared of affirming biological similarity, mm -hmm. right? We get really terrified of this idea of like, oh, I can't say that a dinosaur looks like a bird in some features because that sounds like evolution. Right. Well, it's nothing wrong to say that something looks like something else. I mean, that's mm -hmm. life, right? A dog looks more like us than a fish. That's okay to say that. Mm -hmm. Just because you have similarity doesn't automatically mean common descent. And that's what an evolutionist is a priori. That's their that's their hypothesis, right? right? Similarity is common descent. And they'll give reasons why it's not sometimes, but that's what they assume. 
Right. For the creationists, we don't have to assume that. And so mm-hmm. there's been good creationist work looking at what are other reasons for biological design. And one of them we notice here is there is this idea of a nested hierarchy, right? Mm-hmm. You have reptiles and inside they have archosaurs, inside they have dinosaurs. Like it, there's this kind of relationship that God built into his mm-hmm. creation um, that you could imagine. And you've done some videos on this, right? Talking about Richard Owen's um, uh, vertebrate Black archetype. Type. Yeah. Right. Um, and so maybe you've got something like that going on that in the way he designed things. But the point is we can affirm biological similarity and relationship between things without right. saying they had to have a common ancestor. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, you bring that up and that's really important, right? That, um, when we say there might be a relationship between organisms that clearly are different kinds from a creationist yeah. perspective, that doesn't mean we're saying common descent and common descent uh means that uh two different taxa have you know have some site some sort of common ancestor in the past that's come about through the evolutionary process over millions of years right. of course we're creationists we do not believe that yeah. but uh, the idea of uh that relationship that something might be closer to something else um based on its anatomy and seeing that more as a design aspect of God, uh, I think is really, I think it's that's a critical thing that we need to be thinking about. And like you say, uh, uh, it, you know, when we start using the word relationship, um, we don't have to be scared, right? We don't have to be, oh, oh, well, well that's evolution, right? No, uh, I think as creationists, we really do need to kind of ponder these aspects of uh, design, common design, and sort of uh, really uh really get into them and in, in, on a deeper aspect to, to mm. maybe even figure out, you know, what, what, how God was sort of putting these things together. And that, I think that's okay. I mean, obviously we can't be certain, right? Because those right. things haven't been revealed in scripture, but we do have nature. We have his uh, design in nature. And so I think it's okay. Do you agree that we can sort of hypothesize about those yeah. things? Yeah. I mean, people have done that for very long periods of time, right? People try to, you know, we have the famous quote from Kepler, right? Thinking God's thoughts after him, right? As he looked at, at right. outer space, you know? And so um, there's always been this idea of, of how do I understand? I know that there's an intelligence behind everything I see around me, right? And so I try and think through why did he design it this way? How did he design it? What is it? You know, what's the relationship right. here? And that's what we should be doing as creationists. That's a good yep. thing. Um, what we don't want to do is, you know, stubbornly assert our particular opinion um, you know, like, no, dinosaurs have to be like this because da, 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 when, you know, yeah, like you said, we can't know for certain many of these things, um, right. you know, we can, we can get hints and make hypotheses and certain things pan out and other things don't, but we need to be really careful that we make, you know, our, our assertions on, on scripture, right. And then on scientific evidence and realize where it is that we hold things loosely versus hold them tightly. Right. So, you know, one other thing I'd point out about this is, you know, as as you were saying at the beginning, this is a really cool thing, right? Um, God has enabled us to learn about this long extinct animal um, from, you know, fossils are laid down by the flood, we think, um, that we had no idea what this is like. I didn't think we'd find, you know, anything about the the larynx or the voice box of a dinosaur, right? I mean, that's really cool. And so we, we've been able to get hints before about certain noises some dinosaurs might have made. Cause like, there's like some hadrosaurs, like Parasaur Lophus that has the big crest, looks like a trombone sticking right, in the back I of his head. Seen that. Yeah. Yeah. And so people have made models of that and blown into them and they do make noise. And so that, that seems reasonable. That's a resonating chamber, mm-hmm. but so many of these dinosaurs, I mean, we just have no clue. And that's always really exciting when you get this extra glimpse, right? You're, you're seeing more and more of how God designed things. And, and that's just, that's always exciting. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we get to see, it's like going to the zoo. It's like stepping out in the Grand Canyon, right? Like you're seeing God's design out there and you can glorify um, him by revealing that to other people, but you yourself can enjoy the glory of God as you ponder these things and look at them. Yeah. So like a paleontological zoo, right? Yeah. Um, exciting stuff to look at. I mean, is there any, inc- in- any inclination about through this find, we can find out what they actually sounded like? I mean, I mean, it's just like a, it's just kind of like a rawr, kind of a dinosaur <laughs> growl, or, I mean, are we talking about Tweety Bird? You know, they do talk about it. Hold on. I want to find it. Because, um... you know, if this tank, ankylosaur, sound like a Tweety Bird, I mean, that'd be kind of, uh, 
I mean, I you know, I'd just love to see the next Jurassic Park movie. Yeah. So they say here, although fossil evidence of the vocal source in non-avian dinosaurs has never been found so far, since Pinacosaurus is similar to birds in having a large kinetic larynx and immobile lungs, this dinosaur likely possessed a non-laryngeal vocal source and enhanced their vocal activity and sound communication like modern birds. So they do think there's something inside there that is generating the noise and then th these things modify it as it comes out. Mm. Um, but they don't say what what exactly they think. So, you know, um, I'm sure someone's going to work on this. Someone's going to come I mean, up with some way to, to test yeah. it, you know, because um, that's what people do. I mean, people sit right. around and think about these things and then they build stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I have to think and it's a big animal. I'd be really shocked if it's like me, you know, like making some kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. bellowing noise. I'm sure that's not going to get in the next Jurassic Park movie, <laughs> no. even if they well, figure it's true. You know, what's other, what's also interesting about these animals, and this was found uh, 10, 20 years ago, they did CT scans of the heads of these things. And it turns out um, their nasal passages are not just like straight back. Like you'd think they have these crazy, I mean, it looks like a crazy oh, straw, you know, yeah. like, you know, things you drink through where right. it goes all the place, seen that. all mm -hmm. over the place back there. And so that's been suggested before. Could that be related to the vocalizations also making some kind of noise with that? Most of the, I think the the best guess as to the primary function of that is actually for cooling down the brain. And there's some good evidence to suggest that, but mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, lots of animals have a structure that can be used for multiple functions and yeah. that, that could be the case there too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I was just doing a bit of background for this and I was just looking at the voice box and the larynx and all the different parts that go into it the, and the, and the vocal cords. And I was thinking to myself, this is a really complex yeah. or organ, you yeah. know, and, uh, just, I mean, it's cool, uh, that we, as you know, Christians and creationists can, uh, discover some of God's glory in, in finding a voice box, but also, you know, when she, once you start looking at the uh, you know, anatomical relationships between parts, again, that gives glory to God for complexity. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's cool. Yeah, it is cool. Uh, anything else that you want to add? You think of significance? Um, no, I think we addressed it. I feel okay. like pretty well. This was a shorter paper than what we've done in the past. And yeah, and I, good. I think that's now, that good. was exciting. That was really, that was, that was exceptionally interesting. Um, and I think we had some good, some good, some creation, some good creationist thoughts there that we, that, that hopefully people can take away. So Dr. McLean, again, thank you. Uh, again, just want to put a plug in for the master's university where Dr. McLean is a paleontologist. Uh, if you're even thinking about going to university, uh, and you want to do a, you know, I don't know, degree in chemistry, don't do that. Go do a degree in geoscience and go to the master's university. Uh, they got some fantastic professors there. Uh, I, I, I mean, like I said, I did my education there, but they didn't have the geoscience program. So anyway, here I am. But uh, everybody out there, uh, thanks again uh, for watching. Uh, there is a uh, website, www.creationunfolding.com. Uh, don't forget, I've got more resources there. Um, don't forget to hit that like button, please. Uh, if you thought this video was in any way uh, informing or interesting, then please hit the like button. It helps that uh, YouTube algorithm along. Uh, subscribe, ring the bell, of course. There is a, a link in the description uh, for donation. If you feel in any way inclined to donate, that would be great as well. Um, and lastly, as always, prayer. If you could pray, for me, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, even if you just spend 20 seconds, bow your head and ask the Lord. So that's it from me today. Thank you and goodbye.